Hey everybody, welcome to Write On, the podcast from Final Draft. We are here to talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Glossop. Today, we have Dickinson creator Alina Smith back on the show. For those of you who haven't seen it, Dickinson follows a young Emily Dickinson as she uses her outsider's perspective to push back on the constraints of society in the 19th century. Only you would show up at a party looking like a wreck. I'm not here for the party. Come on, I need to know. Emily. What did you think of my poems? Tell me. I loved them. I always love your poems. But I can't be your only reader anymore. You need to share your writing with the world. There's someone that I need you to meet. Sam Bowles. This could be the man to put you in the spotlight. I'm always interested in hearing a new voice. What if I don't want fame? How do you want to be remembered? I'm thrilled that I could bring the two of you together. Feels like destiny. It is so crazy. Sue is an influencer. I don't want to disappear from this earth without anybody knowing who I am. Does anybody else have any intentions? The witches of Salem walked so we could run. Sometimes when I write, I lose control. You're about to become world famous overnight. Your aura is negative right now. I used to have this confidence, but now since I met him. What a crazy day this is. Not as crazy as what's going on up here. She's so extra. You could put your name on what you wrote. Would you? I would. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. You pressured me into this, and I don't even recognize you. Fame's kind of like death. What's up, girl? Part of me is pretty sure that fame isn't good for me. In fact, I think it could be very dangerous. What? It's like your brain is on fire. Oh, that tracks. Alina and guest host Sade Sellers discussed how the show breaks the typical rules of television, creating a fun contemporary tone while hewing to historical fact, how she originally pitched the show, and more. Check it out. Welcome back, everyone. It's Sade here, and I am interviewing someone I highly admire very much, Elena Smith of Dickinson on Apple TV. Hi, Elena. Hi. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for doing this. People can't see you, but you are in your trailer on set for season three. I know you can't say much, but in two words, what could you say about season three that your fans would appreciate? Oh, boy. Okay, if you really want just two words, Civil War. <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, if I can expand a little bit, it's a, you know, a really interesting fact about Emily Dickinson on top of the sort of core interesting fact, which is that, you know, she wrote 2000 poems and basically chose to keep them all secret. The greatest number of those poems were written during the four years of the Civil War. And it's this very interesting fact that this person who we think of as being so kind of cloistered and protected in her own, you know, domestic space um, and not necessarily out engaged with the world or the politics of the time, uh, nevertheless seems to have had this creative, you know, fire that was raging at the same time that the fires of war were tearing America apart. And so I think that season three is trying to ask this question of like, can we consider Emily Dickinson a war poet? Oh, I love that. And then for me, I, I did study Dickinson in high school. I remember that, like, obviously that was part of everyone's English course, but I never knew as much about her until I started watching her show. And then I fell down the worst Wikipedia rabbit hole. And <laughs> it's just like, by the end, I was on like a page for nuclear physics. And I was like, how did we end up here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, we're trying to study Dickinson. Awesome. When was your first experience with Emily and her work and do you remember well, what that felt like I was into poetry in high school uh definitely read some Emily Dickinson in high school definitely wrote some poems in high school myself and then later after I graduated from college I picked up a biography of Emily Dickinson at a bookstore and I actually got really interested in the facts of her life the fact 
as I said, that she wrote all these poems and, and more or less chose to keep them a secret. The fact that she seems to have had this very complicated, intimate relationship with her childhood best friend who became her brother's wife and who she lived next door to for her whole life and wrote many love letters and poems to. The fact that her family was this sort of group of codependent oddballs that, you know, everyone makes such a big deal about the fact that Emily never married and never left home, but really none of the Dickinson kids ever left home. Lavinia also grew up to be a kind of crazy cat lady spinster. Austin you know, made the big power move of moving across the lawn into a house next door and continuing to work for his father and even in some ways kind of just become his father. They were very tied in to the town of Amherst and the whole history of Amherst College, which Emily's grandfather had helped to found. And I grew up in the Hudson Valley. And um, while that is not technically part of New England, it has very New england vibes. And a, a lot of the place, the landscape, it still looks very 19th century. You know, there's graveyards and horse farms and barns. And all that was very familiar to me. And um, I definitely resonated with the experience of like sitting at your bedroom window, looking out at a field, thinking about the weather and wishing that you had someone that really understood you. Yes, um, which yes. I feel like is the, is the kind of core Dickinsonian experience. Um, I did that this morning on my walk with my dog. I was listening to Evermore, Miss Taylor Swift, after rewatching, like binge rewatching all of your episodes going, I just wish I was in a field with my lover making bread. <laughs> It's cottage core. That's all it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's really, it's so cool. I was, as I was rewatching your episodes, I was like, it's so crazy that you could be hundreds of years apart from a real person, but still connect with them. Cause the fact that Emily couldn't be her fully realized self, or she had to felt pressure to be this perfect woman and, and then a wife, and she couldn't be a writer. I, I definitely resonated with that as I'm the only writer in my family. Everyone's in a professional professional industry. I would say like a medical industry or an automotive industry. So I love that your show kind of taps into the something that is in about time period, right? That's something women go through today. And you're a mom of two twins. So I know you know all about it. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I think that's kind of, you know, I think what, what Dickinson is up to in terms of its sometimes pretty bleak humor is making this point that the past is still all over us and on top of us and inside of us. Like sometimes it feels like a corset of, mm -hmm. of history that we're still wearing and the expectations for women or the way that, you know, narrative is framed around any type of marginalized person. You know, the, the sort of sense of a history that has been erased or has gone missing, make it complicated and difficult to figure out how to be a person in the world today. Mm -hmm. And I think that by having this kind of formal experiment where the show looks and feels and behaves like a perfect period piece on the surface, but contains within it all of these kind of rebellious, chaotic mm -hmm. energies of contemporary consciousness, queerness, internet brain, all the things that we know so well today. But but again, you know, people are always asking me like, okay, so you you sort of like changed the facts. And like, I didn't change the facts at all. I just changed, I guess, the attitude inside of those facts or mm -hmm. something, which again is like, you know, this is a show about a poet. So we're also exploring subjectivity and the fact that Emily's the most exciting things that happened to Emily Dickinson in her life happened in her head. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen to her in her mundane external reality where really most of the time she was like fetching water because they didn't have indoor plumbing. So, you know, uh, but then she was writing the poems that truly are like psychedelic, you know, like they're, they're, they're exploring and exploding consciousness and reality in, in very provocative, challenging ways. So the cool thing about getting to make a TV show out of this is that we get to go on the carriage ride with death or we get to have the conversation with the bumblebee or we get to feel you know the volcano erupt and that's sort of the the force of poetry really um, well, I, I want to talk to you um about yes not 
changing the facts of who Emily was, but expounding on it um, in this visual medium. And you break so many rules on this show. It was refreshing to see. I think it was, um, I forgot who who said it. Someone mentioned on Twitter yesterday that no one's, everyone's afraid to break rules on TV anymore. We're so rigid. And and then, you know, I rewatched the show and I was like, There's, these rules are breaking all over the place. And this is just so fun. Like, how was it when you're creating this show? Did you think no one's going to want to take this risk? No one's going to want to see a show like this. You know, I think that I got really lucky that I started, well, I had already been working on Dickinson for a few years before we sold it to Apple, but it was all in a kind of moment where all of these new digital streaming platforms were kind of coming out of the gate and wanting to announce themselves. I think I just sort of instinctively understood like, you know, you you need something that's going to be a little bit different, right? Because otherwise, how are you going to get people's attention? And I felt like it was, I guess it was, it's the balance in the show between elegance and attitude. So Mm -hmm. we are breaking so many rules, but at the same time, we are having this beautiful cinematography and very grounded emotional performances between this family. I mean, Dickinson at its core is really just a family drama. And I mean, as well as the coming of age story of a young artist. And I think that, again, it was like, there's a certain detailed tidiness to the world that uh, then is always standing in contrast with the attitude of of like, you know, taboo and edginess and saying the things that shouldn't be said about the past and about the roles that, you know, people, different people have played. And, and so I, I guess it was like those two things together gave me the confidence to say like, this is a show that's going to stand out. And right now, that's the kind of show that that people need because there's yeah. just so much out there. And if you're trying to, you know, launch a platform that, that you know, you, you kind of want to, I guess you want both. You want your comfort food and you want your, your edgier stuff. A lot of our listeners are actual screenwriters. So I do want to tap into the pitching of this show just for a little bit, because I know that they're all like, can you ask her about that? Bible, no Bible. How long was your pitch? Do you remember about pitching the show and what feedback you got? Did you change your pitch? And any of that information you can share with us? So the way that the pitch for Dickinson worked is that it was a lot more than a pitch. Let's call it like pitch plus, because I had a pilot script that I had written that was actually at this point, two years old and had gotten feedback and notes from numerous you know, very smart producers and different people I trusted. So, and that pilot is the pilot. Like it's literally what we shot, you know, it's like there's a hip hop soundtrack and that, you know, um, death comes in the carriage and that Emily and Sue make out in the orchard. And, you know, it's very much like it is what it is. Uh, it's very, I think, visual and like clear on the page, like the the tone and the vibe of the show. But then in addition to that, we also I had created a document that basically had a plan for three seasons of the show, which is literally the plan that has been followed. So, you know, the the thing is that there's just, there was a huge amount of work up front, I guess is what I would say. And then we also had David Gordon Green attached to direct the pilot, which was really sort of important to me in terms of also letting people know that this wasn't going to be what you expected when you heard the the name Emily Dickinson, that like this was something that had like the edge and the swagger of Eastbound and Down or Vice Principals, as well as like the lyrical indie sensibility of David's like films um, that he made in addition to those shows. And so, yeah, I think, I think it was like all those things together. And then after it was after we sold the show, it was also like a hugely long process of writing all the scripts mm-hmm. and in some cases like rewriting and reconceiving of the way that, you know, the story would be told in season one and all the scripts were written before we went into production. So it was, you know, I don't think that anything in our TV landscape anymore looks like the old story you hear of like, pitch green light like it wasn't yeah. like that. It was very it was a very slow drip kind of process and took a lot of persistence from me and commitment to the vision that kept it going the whole time and then when we also got when Haley 
accepted the role of Emily, that was also a huge boost for the show and also kind of told us like, well, this is the, this is the show that we're making. This is the way, um, this is how modern and fresh it can be because I think those were the things that Haley was bringing to it. And we mentioned earlier, you're on season three now. So wow, uh, time sure goes fast, right? When <laughs> you blink. Um, you know, it just all, it all flies by, yeah. <laughs> Let, what are your, uh, what are some tips that you, as a showrunner yourself, you've taken from, okay, our first season, we got that out of the way and now I'm in season three. These are things that I'm improved on since we first started. Well, that's an interesting question. I think, I mean, every process gets streamlined as you do it more, right? And even a, a, a kind of show that's as difficult as ours is to nail tonally. So this always takes a lot of attention to like birth an episode of Dickinson. But, you know, I do think we, we have such a strong team at this point in terms of behind the camera and in front of the camera and everybody really does feel like a family. And so we all know what show we're making now. So that's really helpful. Also, I think... Specifically for me, you know, as a writer, like what I love to do is I love to write for performance. I love to write for actors. And the greatest thing for me is having a show that is about a family. Families are kind of some of our most enduring relationships. Yeah. And to have these relationships with these actors that I've gotten to know so well over the years that I really feel like I'm sort of channeling them at this point into these roles and to know that. I'm not, in other words, I'm not just writing the character of Austin now. I'm writing Adrian Blake Ensko's Austin. And I'm right. I'm in my relationship with Adrian or Anna or Ella or Haley or Jane or Toby or any of our, our actors. I feel like I know who they are. I know their strengths and and where they shine. And all I want to do is is sort of right enjoyable roles for them to play. That's the the greatest thing for me is is the kind of like getting to come back. Whereas I suppose, you know, if you were making a film or putting on a play, which right. is what I do, you wouldn't have the chance to come back to the same actors in the same roles, but also let them evolve. No, I think that's great advice. And I, I love that you're saying you're writing Austin's version of this character now. <laughs> like you have to, it shifts. On the topic of family, I want to know, how are you maintaining that work-life balance with having, t I, mean, I have twin brothers and I just remember walking into my mother when they were breastfeeding, when she was breastfeeding and she had one here, one here, and she was just asleep. And she was just like, let them go. I was like, do you want me to take them? She's like, no, they're eating. I'm just going to take a nap. <laughs> She's a single mom. We had to, she still had to go to work. So she had no choice. Right. Well, look, I mean, I always, I feel like the challenge for us all as women is that, I mean, not every woman chooses to have children and, and that's, that's totally fine. But if you are at a place where you're going to make that choice, sometimes, or a lot of the time it can intersect with exactly the moment when your career is kind of requiring you to like, quote unquote, lean in, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, it's, oh God, I mean, I, sometimes I, I was thinking the other day that it's like, there's this little mini apocalypse, like designed in the center, of, like every woman's life. And we are, we are still, you know, this is the whole point Dickinson makes, but you know, in, in the 18, 60s, women were not allowed to vote. They were not allowed to legally own property. They belonged to their fathers. They belonged to their husbands. The idea of women as independent citizens with agency and college educations and careers is much newer than we realize. Mm -hmm. And we're still figuring it out. And it's requiring the shape of society to change again and again to try and like accommodate this. And I guess I would just say that, you know, we need to embrace femininity in, in men and we need to, um, as well as embracing it in ourselves, we need to be redistributing all kinds of balances and in terms of gender and responsibility and caretaking. Um, but I do think as a society in general, we need to prioritize caretaking a lot more than we have. Yes. Yeah. On yeah. set daycare. I've been screaming okay. it for years, years. There's no reason I, I'm why. Proud that right now we have a, a female director who just uh, had a baby and just went off to pump uh, in between takes of a scene. So brilliant. Yeah. More of that. Yeah. More of that. Yes. I only have a few questions left, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about your amazing fan base. I was scrolling through Twitter, just searching the Dickinson hashtag. And I was like, these are some passionate fans, man. 
I love our fans. I think we have the most polite, wonderful fans, but they're so passionate about, about most particularly about Emily and Sue. And I think that that is so meaningful to me because, you know, thinking about it, I'm not sure that there has ever been a relationship like Emily and Sue's on TV before, but it's certainly one that feels very representative uh, to me and to a lot of people that I know. And I think that that's where the fans are coming from. And also just the amazing chemistry between Haley and Ella is this is a very complicated relationship between two women. Talk about embodying different roles. Like they are lovers. They are also best friends. They are also a poet and her reader. They are also sisters. It's really complicated. And I think that we all know that intimate relationships between women is an undiscovered territory is and and you know young women trying to figure out like how to come of age and how to take their places in a society that still has these heavy expectations of them in terms of you know becoming mothers and wives and and being you know dutiful housewives yeah emily and sue is a, it's an amazing romance in truth in history and biographical fact and then our representation of it in our show which makes it into a more of a kind of like millennial gen z romance between the two of them. I'm just so happy that everyone has responded to it as as passionately as they have. And I'm really proud of, of the relationship in the show. And in particular, I think because it's it's not simple and there isn't just one easy answer about Emily and Sue. I will say you kids are so lucky. I say that as a 31 year old, but the kids are so lucky because when I was growing up, it was the closest thing was Tara and Willow on Buffy, but we didn't have Twitter. We had to go on these CD message boards and wait like a day for our friends to respond. And that was it. And even then they didn't dive into that relationship as much as you've done with Emily and Sue because it was- And I will say, I mean, so I'm 41 and uh, for me, for sure, Dickinson is the show that I would have most wanted to have watched when I was in my 20s. Like I was, I was basically like, the combination of contemporary music with period dresses and a queer romance at the center, like that's, you know, I, 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 I'm really happy that we pulled it off. <laughs> you ever think you could talk to Shondaland and do a, a crossover episode with Bridgerton and just see Emily and her place in high society and how she would do? I think that would be so awesome. Um, I, uh, I was on a panel with the Bridgerton showrunner the other day and he seemed super cool. And uh, yeah, I think we should, we should bring that up. Let's make it happen, <laughs> Apple and Netflix. Let's do it for the fans. Yeah. All right. Well, I know you're you're on set currently, so I have one question left for you. It's a question we ask all of our guests. What advice would you give your younger writer self? Hmm. Oh my gosh. I guess maybe maybe like try try to lighten up a little bit. Like try to try to take it easy sometimes. I I think I I mean I'm definitely a person who has a lot of anxiety and works really, really hard. And all of that's great. And it it has paid off obviously in certain ways. But I think that on a day-to-day basis I could probably like go a little easier and have a little more fun. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, no I'm like I'm like you. I always say like I'm a Hermione. I have to learn how to get out of my box because I'm like we have to follow this rule and this rule. So yeah. I I think that's a lesson we could all take yes. from ourselves, especially after surviving what we survived last Maybe year. Maybe that's where this is coming from. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, Elena Smith, thank you so much. Congratulations and all the huge success for Dickinson one and two. And now you're on set for three. I, I look forward to watching many, many more seasons of a wonderful show that I really enjoy. And the fans out there, God bless them. Um, be kind to her on Twitter. Okay. She's, (laughs) she's doing her best. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much. It was so great talking to you. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Thanks to Elena Smith for coming on the show again and to Sade Sellers for hosting. Dickinson is streaming on Apple TV Plus right now. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Thank you.